Welcome to CST 8215. Uh, my name is Dan Goudreau, or Daniel Goudreau, or Hey You, or whatever you choose to use. All right. I always give an introduction about me because often some of the profs will not tell you why you should listen to them. And I choose to tell you why you should listen to me right off the bat. Uh, number one, I'm a college graduate, just like you guys hope to be. So I don't have a degree. I went straight from college to work and I've been working ever since. So I have been unemployed for a total of one week since 1996. I am a professional developer. That's what I do. In the morning, I get up at 5.30 in the morning, go to work, go home, come and teach. Um, I, cur I currently work for a company called Catlink Technology Corporation. Almost nobody's ever heard of them. We're not a big company. But you've probably seen a lot of our handiwork around. Uh, we make systems for sign makers. So it's software. We, our biggest competitor is Adobe and Corel. Uh, however, in the sign making niche industry, we have a, I'd say, 65% stranglehold on the market in the sign making side of the deal. So if you've seen a car that's been wrapped with stickers, whether it's a business one or Natasha, take your, it's probably printed with our software. Uh, if you've ever seen, if those of you that are old enough probably remember the old Air Canada planes that had the Canada Goose on the back, it's our software that cut out the templates for the paint job. So, you know, we deal with big pieces of information. Um, I'm a web developer specifically that specializes on the database side of the deal. I've been a database developer since the day I started, I left school. And uh, the anecdote moment is, I almost failed database administration because I'm never going to work with databases, ever. I did great on the SQL and the design side, but the administration, I almost failed. I'll admit it right up front because I didn't think I was going to use it. Guess what I did as my very first job? Yeah, and my second job. And my third job when I worked for uh, Digital Compact HP. I was there for the, three mer for the two mergers. And then after when I went to Cadlink, I've been working with database systems ever since. So no matter what you do as a developer, if you think you're not going to touch a database, this is me telling you you're wrong. You're going to touch a database no matter what you do. Okay, so what kind of personality can you expect from me? Uh, I have a fairly loose and easygoing teaching style. I do not have lecture notes. These are my lecture notes. What you see on the screen is what I'm using to remind myself what I'm supposed to teach. Now, as someone who's been working in database for 20-something years, 21 years now, literally, I know the material. I just need to know what I'm supposed to teach for the day. Um, I've taught CST 8215 for oh, four or five years now. Um, I'm sarcastic. I apologize now, not that I care. But if I do offend you, you know, if I do say something that offends you, please let me know, like, you know, either right away or after class so I try to not repeat what I just said. Um, my, short, my list has been pretty short, but, you know, there are things I can't say in front of a group, apparently. Um, I do understand that life happens. The, my dog ate my laptop. Believe it or not, I've seen it. A student brought in their laptop that had chunks bitten out of it by their, by their dog. That's proof. If life happens, prove to me that something's happening, and I'll probably, you know, make an exception or an adjustment. However, by the same token, I only put up with that for so long. Like, if your life is a rolling disaster all the way through the term, maybe you need to re-examine things. Um, this is where I say I don't suffer fools. In other words, if life happens, that's okay. If life keeps happening to you, cool. NVIDIA video card. Every time it's connected to HDMI, it does that for after about five minutes. Um, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Uh, but that means that I will probably pick on pretty much everybody in this group. That doesn't mean that I'm picking on you personally. It just means that you got picked on that day. Um, but that also means that I can take pretty much anything I could you dish out also. And we, I have a line also that you can't cross and you'll know right away when you go too far. Um, I'm like the same token. You know, if, if I can get along with you, you get along with me, and everybody's going to enjoy themselves because database can be pretty dry. Thus, personality has to carry it. All right. 
Textbook. <sighs> Modern Database Management 12th edition. Why? Because I've been told that's the one you have to use. Being honest. Um, it is actually a very good textbook. It's the exact same textbook that I used 20 years ago. Except I used edition 2. No, 3. Sorry. I, th I think I still have it at the back of my storage space in my basement. And I opened, actually I know I have it because I opened it when I was told I had to use this textbook last year. And the same jokes are still in it. All they've done is added to the back and changed some of the wording in the middle. But the content's the same. Um, so it's a book worth having. Uh, apparently it does get reused later on depending what program you're in. And right now I'm not sure. How many of you are in CT? How many of you are in CP? Ah, okay. So a couple of CT guys and a bunch of CP people. Okay. Uh, the CT guys are the three-year program. The CP guys are the two-year program. That's the difference. Well, there's a lot more than that, but that's, you know, the core difference. Um, but it is a good textbook. And one, explain how the course is delivered in a little bit. You'll see where it comes into effect. Okay. Dan's rules for success in my class. Come to lecture. And I don't take attendance. Why? Uh, I explained, I think, on the next slide, either on one or two slides later down the road, but some of you notice I've got a headset on. Now, there's a reason for that. It's because I record my lectures. Um, so the reason I say come to lecture, though, to succeed is it gives you a chance to ask questions. If you're watching the recording later, can you ask a question and get an immediate answer? No. Therefore, it's helpful to come to class, at least to lecture. Uh, rule number two, do your work. You know, it's hard to get graded if you don't give me anything to grade. Uh, three, hand in your work on time. That's a no-brainer. I work in industry. Um, we have penalties if we don't deliver on time when we have OEM work. Um, the way it works in my class is if you are one week late, so assignments do say Tuesday midnight, and you deliver the next day, 10% off. The penalty is 10% for the, for the next week. That means that whether you deliver the next day or five days later, it's still only 10% off. But if you are one more week late, you get zero. And it's not automatic. I literally sit there at midnight and wait for it to happen. I go zero, 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 zero. Unless life happened and you could have proven it to me. And usually that means that life happened before the real due date, not the extension. And you've made arrangements with me and not 10 minutes before it was due. Because odds are I'm not paying attention at, you know, 10 to midnight, I should be sleeping. Um, okay, item number four. If you don't hear me assign it in class, then it's not due. Uh, that item I've added in because Blackboard used to be really flaky with its dates and it would actually change the dates on my assignments for me. Um, why? I don't know, but it stopped doing that, but I actually actively still put it in the slide because one of these days Blackboard will do what Blackboard does. Um, that being said, I don't hate Blackboard. Um, okay. Labs are due by the start of the next lecture. Um, the actual fact that slide's wrong is due at the end of the lecture, at the, by midnight, if I remember what I've said on the calendar. Um, I changed my mind at the last minute, so I just didn't update my slideshow. Uh, in other words, you have a week to do your labs. Late labs are zero. Why? Because it was due. Most of my labs can be done usually in 45 minutes. You've been assigned a two-hour block of your life to come to lab. Whether you choose to come to lab or not, I don't care. However, if you don't come to lab and you don't hand in your work, I can guarantee my gap factor is zero. Thus is your grade. And if you guys don't know what gap factor is, look it up. It's I don't give a... There we go. Okay, what can you expect this term? Uh, lectures, labs, assignment, tests, and a two-part final exam. So, lectures go without saying. This is what I'm doing. Uh, labs. They were kind of nice to us. They booked all our labs after our lecture, which is fantastic. 
I don't get this weird disconnected lab from lecture bit. Uh, essentially, whatever I cover in lecture is what your lab is for that week. And it should normally follow through properly. Um, now, lectures are free form. I don't, like I said earlier, I don't use lecture notes. I don't have them. Uh, sometimes I have a point form bullet list. You'll see me pull a little piece of paper out of my pocket once in a while when there's something I know I have to talk about. Um, labs are gradual and they peak in difficulty around week nine. Labs do this. Then they do that. This is in Dark Souls. <laughs> and, you know, and it's not uh, Minecraft. <laughs> it's this. Um, a black, assignments are submitted via Blackboard. And you usually have at least two weeks to do your assignments. They're not killer. They might be a lot of work, but they're not a killer. So again, there's no excuse for not doing them. Uh, tests are done online, and you have a week to do them. I don't, do, I don't waste class time on tests. That means that at the end of, the lect of a lecture, a test becomes magically available to you. You have one week to do it. They're open book. nothing else to say. They're on Blackboard. Um, I've, the, where I think they take about half an hour to an hour on average, so really if you've had, you know, an entire week to do a half hour test, and you don't do it, you know, the sympathy isn't there. When does what start? Uh, they start after the given lecture of that given week. So, for example, I will warn you, like there's the, the, all the due dates actually are coming up in a second. Uh, but they're, the first test is at the end of uh, end of June, if I remember right, or end of May. And one at the end of May, one at the end of June, and I think the end of July is getting ready for the exam. So it's reasonable. You got seven days. All right, lecture recording. I try. This is a value added service. Um, some of you have already experienced me, and some of you have not, because I recognize three faces in here. Um, actually from a different program, <laughs> go figure. You've decided to choose a different career, uh, power to you. Um, but that being said, um, I record the lectures, I process the video on my own time. I am gonna be trying something a little different with this first lecture with how I'm recording the video and I don't know if it's gonna work or not. So hopefully today's the video is good. If not, I'll go back to the old way of doing it. Um, what happens is after it's processed, I upload to YouTube. I've been given permission to upload my lectures to YouTube so you don't have to connect to the college to watch it. Uh, why? Uh, for well, The college does have a media server that we can upload our videos to, but they choose to re-encode our videos, and I came out sounding like a smurf. And literally, it looked like um, it was very pixelated. It looked like certain kinds of movies that are highly pixelated. That's what my videos looked like. Literally, it was like watching a video from like 1996. It was totally unusable. Uh, so I finally got permission from Andy, the court uh, the chair, to actually allow me to use YouTube to upload my videos. Um, and after each process, I put a link in Blackboard for you guys to get to there. Uh, you will be able to find my YouTube channel if you search for CST8215. Uh, last year's lectures are there. My lectures to CST8250 are there. So currently, there's close to... Uh, 40 hours worth of lecture material on there, just so you know. And uh, yeah, it's going to be in 1080p glory, we hope. I don't guarantee it, but I hope it goes. Okay, what shall we be learning? Basic database design. You're going to learn the terminology, the how to do it. Um, normalization, which I explained like in two weeks three weeks. Um, essentially, by the time you're done that segment of the term, you should be able to design a basic database on your own. You should also be able to understand a more complex database that you've been given. You're going to learn SQL. SQL is the language you use to talk to database servers. Uh, you're going to learn views, triggers, and store procedures. That's like right at the end of the term. Uh, that's where you learn how to program the database server. And then there's other stuff, because there's sometimes stuff that leaks in as we go. But that's basically what you will be learning. And by the way, 
Um, some people that teach 8215 will teach in a uh, dual topic method. The first hour is design, the second hour is SQL. I do design, then I do SQL, and then I do the hard stuff, which means that for the first three, four weeks, I focus only on design. Just get that out of the way. I evaluate you on that. And then a little bit of that leaks to the final exam. But once I'm done evaluating you on that topic, we're done with it. Then we move on to the next one. So that means that if you're really good at concepts like design, but you have a hard time with the programming side, I'm not going to melt your brain for two different kinds of topics at the same time. One chunk, one chunk, one chunk. The terms divide in three chunks as listed on there. The other stuff is me saying, by the way, the stuff that's going to leak in as we go. Sometimes people ask me questions that cause me to actually expand upon concepts. All right, evaluation. 8215 is an interesting course because it's evaluated on many points. Um, some other courses, like one I just finished teaching, has evaluated on three things, tests, labs, and a final exam, and that's it. Uh, but this has lab activity for 10%. Quizzes for 10%, assignments are 10% each. Um, two tests, each worth 10%, that's 20%. Uh, there's a final exam for theory, which is worth 20%, and then there's a practical final exam, also worth 20%. So you know when you read your course outline, it says final exam worth 40%. 20 plus 20 is a 40. So that was sarcasm. Um, so these two together count as your, final ex as your final exam percentage. The good news is if you're good at the practical, it's not going to kill you. If you're good at the theory, you kind of suck at the practical, you know, you still have a chance of getting a half-decent grade because it's been broken down into two chunks as opposed to historically, up till about a year and a half ago, two years ago, there was a 40% exam at the end. And it was a killer. And if you failed that, sometimes you often failed the course. Whereas in this case, there's chances. OK. This is a 3-2-3 course. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen these kinds of numbers yet. Uh, three hours of theory. That means there's two hours in class and one hour online. That's your hybrid portion. There's two hours of lab and three hours of study time. That's the theory. Obviously, I can't monitor study time. Uh, essentially, in my mind, study time is homework time. Uh, not you're going to sit there and memorize everything. And I kind of leak the online into study time. So the online learning leaks into the, the study time and the online time kind of leak into each other. So realistically, it's actually less homework for you guys if it works out well. Um, now. A few things of note, the hybrid versus the lab lectures. The hybrids I'm using for you guys to actually learn the stuff in the textbook. I'm not a big fan of textbooks, I never have been. Why? Because they get out of date really fast. The problem is with database, it hasn't changed in 20 years. What you're doing 20 years ago is exactly how you do it today. Some of the rules have changed in how you approach it, but the actual methodology is the same. It's one of the few pieces of development that doesn't evolve very quickly. And the ones that did evolve really quickly are discovering that it was a stupid idea and they're going back to what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So the people that are pushing for big SQL and no SQL and dupe and all that, stuff, they're all coming back to us because we were right. Yeah. Because we got it right the first time. Well, no, it's not that. It's the, it still is evolving. Like they're adding stuff on, but the techniques that have worked for the last twenty years continue to work. For continue to work. A database server is a database server. The biggest difference is now is that you don't need to spend fifty thousand dollars to get a database server. You spend fifteen seconds downloading it off the internet, and the one you get for fifty off that fifteen second download off the internet is just as capable as the one you're spending fifty thousand dollars on. Um, that's where it's changing. The environment is changing, not the technique behind it. Because data is data. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to record this. I'm, I hate, but I'm, you know, I might bleep it out later. Uh, I see Oracle dying. Uh, probably in about 20 years. Uh, why? They are, their sales have been flat for four years. The only people buying from Oracle are currently locked in Oracle customers. And they don't support net neutrality. They actually are against it. So it's not helping them in the, the uh, internet circles anymore. Their policies aren't very good, so people don't like what they're doing. Um, and the fact that a, the cheapest Oracle install is 50,000 bucks. Or you could go install Postgres with the Oracle Compute plugin for zero dollars, and it does 95% of what Oracle does. You know, that last 5%, I'm sure we can find a way around it to save ourselves 50 grand almost every year. You know, so that's why. That's one of the changes I expect. Um, other changes I expect to see in the industry, uh, Microsoft is going to start dominating, which is kind of scary to say, but they actually, they're doing it right. I didn't think, I don't think I'd ever thought I'd say that 10 years ago, uh, but they're getting it right on their, at least their server products. Desktop, yeah. But their server products, are they're doing pretty good. Um, but what's changing? Um, it used to be that the database developers used to dictate to the desktop developers how the data was going to be handled. The biggest change that's happened is not how the data is controlled, it's who's deciding how the data is controlled. The desktop developers are starting to dictate more and more what the database should look like as opposed to the database guy saying, I got a degree in this, you're going to do what I say. The web guys, the developer guys are going, whatever. Hang on, I'll go take a course and I'll take care of this myself. Right, so that things are becoming more flexible and agile. And that's actually causing the, all the old ways of doing things, the methodology to change, but the techniques haven't. It's just when is it, who's doing it and when it's happening that's changing. Does that answer your question? Okay, so back to the uh, our online. Essentially what's gonna happen is you have a textbook, there's certain pages that have been assigned for you to read. What you're gonna do is that's your study time is you're gonna read those pages, then you do the hybrid. It's a quiz, you're gonna answer a quiz a week. This, the purpose of this is to prepare you for the tests. And those tests, the purpose of those tests is to prepare you for the exam. Um, I use the lectures to provide a more holistic approach to the, the whole database topic. I don't know if holistic's the right word. Um, caustic, maybe? Um, essentially what's happening is I come in, I talk about the topic, I expand upon the concepts that are in the book using plain English. So in other words, in the book you will see this really complicated word, this is what it actually means. And this is how you actually use it. Uh, the that textbook is notorious for using lots of words that, you know, you could they write three pages where you could write it in one sentence. Um, unfortunately, they actually have some useful stuff mixed into all those words. Um, I tend to abridge that stuff significantly and cover it in class. Okay. Now, here's the official statement. This actually comes from the other uh, 8215 prof that was teaching it last term and who's teaching the introductory database course for CP for years. Uh, you have to write the final exam. You might get to the final exam and say, I've got 60% in the course. You don't, your name doesn't show up on one of those exam sheets, you're done. Just putting it out there, unless there's a really good reason why you can't write it and you've made arrangements and I've made an exemption. It's gotta be a really good one. Boom, you could write your name on the exam, answer the first question, and then walk out if you want. But you have to write the exam, quote marks. Um, you need 50% on all tests and exams. And you also need 50% on assignments and group work. The group work is actually piggybacking on one of the assignments. I've been told I gotta assign at least one piece of group work. Yay. I love it as much as you guys do. Um, and then you have to complete both assignments, and you're supposed to finish to do all your labs. That's the theory. You know, as long as you try to do all your labs, I guess I'm happy. Okay, here are the due dates. Assignment one is going to be due June 20th, theoretically. These dates are maybe flexible. Just putting it out there that there may be some adjustments in there. 
Assignment due two will be due July 18th. Test one is planned for June 6th. Did you notice I said the word planned? Um, that's the due date, by the way, not when I sign it. That's the when you, you know, you're now officially late for it. And uh, test two is planned for July 4th. In other words, you're going to have one test and one assignment at the end of this month, one test and assignment at the end of next month. That's it. All right. Next, next slideshow. That's still recording? Good, good, good. Okay. All right, I also meant to mention I don't take breaks in the lecture. I tried to finish my lectures earlier instead. But if you do need to go, you know, do a call of nature, just get up and walk out. I'm not going to feel offended. Um, you know, such is life. If you see me take a break suddenly, that's probably what's happening. <laughs> just putting it out there. Um, but that being said, I'm going to go into the first lecture. Uh, just so you know, the first two, three lectures are actually pretty slide heavy. I'm not a fan of slideshows, but theory begets slides. Um, both these slideshows should now be on Blackboard under course documents, just so you know. Uh, the CSI should have should be showing up either tonight or tomorrow. tomorrow. So if you're looking for the CSI and it's not there, bet that's because it's still sitting there. Um, I just wanted to make sure all my dates were right before I sent it up. All right, so here comes the theory, guys. So much fun. Okay. The first lecture is covering the basics of database design. Essentially, today plus next week's lecture will prepare you for next week's lab. This week's lab, on the other hand, is getting your shit installed. So I've been you know, if you've got it working, congratulations, you're already ahead of the game. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about types of tables, types of relations. I'm going to talk about diagramming, the basic parts of a table, and naming conventions. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on this, and I will explain the logic behind this and the whys. Okay. Types of tables also known as entities. When you're talking about database design, a lot of people who have, how many people here have actually played with a database server of some sort before I continue? Okay, a ah, dozen of you. Um, not a baker's dozen. Um, so those of you that have played with databases have heard the phrase table before, probably. Now uh, you may not have heard of the phrase entity. Here's the difference. Entity applies to design, table applies to physical. So an entity becomes a table, a table became from an entity. Essentially they're the same thing, they just have a different name depending where in the process they're at. Right? It's, and just depending on where you are in the process they have a different name, thus they share the same concept, essentially. Uh, essentially an entity is a little fuzzier than a table, as in it's not quite defined. Okay. So there's two kinds of tables. And this slide is actually a glossary type slide. <coughs> there's reference tables or reference entities. Uh, some people know them as lookup tables. Uh, I know that I've heard it called values tables for whatever reason you'd want to use that phrase. Because uh, that's kind of pointless because a table holds values. Um, it's used to hold static data. It normally has two to four fields slash attributes, and it's usually always a parent. The parent thing will come later in the term. Um, but by this, I mean that holds static data. Okay, how many of you have filled out an online form in the last two weeks? Probably most of you, right? Do you remember picking a country from a dropdown? There it is. That's a reference table. You pick title, Mr., Mrs., you know, other. Um, you know, pick a state or a province, depending on the case may be. Uh, you pick something else from a drop-down. Those drop-downs are coming from a database table. Hopefully they are. And that database table is a reference table. 
stuff goes into it, but it doesn't change very often. You add values, you change values occasionally, but usually what's in it pretty much stays the same all the time. You know, what changes the most? Usually the European countries and the countries drop down. Why? Because they keep changing names. Yugoslavia became Croatia, Montenegro, and Serbia. And then one of them is changing names again. Last I heard. Um, then you've got regular tables or regular entities. They essentially, regular tables contain standard data. Okay. In a minute, I'll be talking about what data is. But it contains standard data, names, addresses, phone numbers, uh, dates of births and numbers, that kind of stuff. Um, it usually has lots of fields, well past two to four. Why? You can't describe a person with only four pieces of information. Um, it can be a parent and or it can be a child. Uh, again, like I said, I'll cover that terminology in a bit. Okay, the next one after we get over the concept of an entity slash table is attributes slash fields. In actual fact, I should have one more thing on there called, also known as column. Depending on what your background is, you may know it as a column, you might know it as a field, you might know it as an attribute, depending what software you've used, obviously. And FileMaker is not a database. I'm sorry, Mac guys, but it's not. It wants to be, but it's not. Um, so, an attribute. An attribute is a property or characteristic of an entity or of a relationship type. That was a lot of verbiage on that one line. Okay. Earlier I said an entity is a table. An entity can also be known as a thing. And by a thing, I mean literally, we're describing something. Your laptop is a thing, a telephone is a thing, technically you're a thing. If that offends you, okay, you're a person that's a thing. Let's be a little more PC. It's a thing. Therefore, a thing is an entity, an entity becomes a table. How do you describe a thing? You describe its attributes. For example, let's describe a person. What would be an, a, a, an attribute of a person? First name, last name, date of birth, SIN number if, it, like, if you're Canadian, or whatever the heck passes for a SIN number wherever you come from. Um, what else? Email address, your home phone number, your, uh, your home address. Keep going. Age, height, weight, which we don't talk about. Um, you know, hair color, which is usually not true. Um, even for guys. Just saying, these are those are attributes to describe something. Uh, a relationship type is essentially it's a type of connection between two things, and depending on whose book you look at, a relationship type can also be an entity. That's where the stupid verbiage comes in, where, you know, depending on what book you use, the verbiage changes. Um, a relationship type could be student, teacher. Even though technically 99% of our attributes are the same, there's net one attribute that's different. I'm in charge and you're not. Essentially. That, that's a relationship type. Classroom is a relationship type, which also is an entity which has attributes. So theoretically, you can switch between relationship types and entities. You can interchange between them. Uh, I recommend you stick to the word entity because it's used more often. But there's always a chance you'll come across the phrase relationship type. Um, all right. Now, when you talk about attributes, there's a few different kinds of things you have to think about when you define attributes for a person. Is it required versus optional? For example, you want to define someone. You would make their name required. You might make their date of birth optional depending what kind of database. Usually not, but you know, you could. You could make email address optional. That's the difference between required and optional. 
If an attribute is required, you cannot define that piece of data without it. For example, here at the school, you all have one piece of data that's absolutely required. Can you guess what it is? Student number. That is your, your primary attribute as far as the college is concerned. Your number that happens to have a name. Okay, simple versus composite attributes. A simple attribute is date of birth. There you go. There's nothing else to say about that. A composite attribute, on the other hand, would be an address. What is an address? It's something that's made up of more than one value. Street, city, state, slash province, postal code, country. Right? That's five pieces of data that make up that one attribute. That's known as a composite attribute. By the way, that's not something you want to do. Later on we discuss about breaking down composite attributes because that's a big no-no. Um, Single-valued versus multi-valued attributes. Okay, once again, single-valued attribute, date of birth. Just know, do you notice that simple and single-valued are pretty much the same thing? Multi-valued is not the same thing as composite. However, multi-valued would be, for example, if we're working with some really dirty data and we want to use uh, what courses you're taking, and I don't know how many courses you guys have been saddled with over the summer, uh, but I'm guessing it's probably three or four. And depending on how your data is defined, a multi-valued attribute would be, you know, CST 8215, CST whatever the heck else you're taking, you know, comma, comma, comma. That's a multi-valued attribute, as in there's four different values that are essentially the same type of object, but they're in there more than once. In other words, there are four different courses, therefore there are four types of objects, but you happen to have four of them attached to you. That's a multi-valued attribute. Yes? Yeah, because somebody about uh, five years ago got their heads out of their butt. Uh, it used to be you'd go and pick, you'd have state or province first, and then a little bit later on the country. And then you go do the drop and go, where's Ontario? Oh, country set the United States. Change it to United States, and then the drop down would reload. Somebody came to the conclusion that maybe if we put country at the top, we can make the rest of this happen so the person doesn't need to keep reloading the form two, three times. That's why. Um, that's just use, uh, that's actually just good usage, not database control. Um, but it does have to do with parent-child relationships also, which I actually use that exact example later. Um, okay. The next one is stored versus derived attributes. Okay. This one's not that hard. A stored attribute is, let's go with date of birth once again. Why? Because it's an easy one. Everybody has a date of birth. God, I hope you all have a date of birth. Otherwise, you know, you might be a clone. <laughs> Don't laugh. I actually had a student once freak out when I said that. Um, but I still go with it. So a, that's a stored value, your date of birth. What is a derived attribute? A derived attribute is a data attribute you can calculate based on something else already in that database. For example, if you store date of birth of March 7th, 75, you can calculate how old that person is. Now, minus whatever March 7th, 1975 tells you how old that person is. That is a derived attribute. Another good example I like to use is, okay, how many of you have bought something off Amazon in the last three weeks? Okay, in the last six months. Okay. Now, some of you aren't being honest. <laughs> or fine, maybe how many of you bought crap off AliExpress? There we go. <laughs> People are going, I don't want to admit that one. <sighs> no, Steam doesn't count because you can only buy one thing at a time. You buy a game, you pay for it, and you're done. If I remember right. What I'm gonna, the example I'm going to use, you go to Amazon, and you're buying cat trees. And you decide you want three of them because you've got three cats, and they keep fighting over the, the one cat tree you have. So you get to pick up the same cat tree and you buy three. So each tree is 30 bucks and you bought three. What would be the derived attribute, which is the line total? Three times 30 is 90. Do we need to store the 90? 
No, because we can calculate it. It's like magic math. It, it means, yeah, it's temporary. There are reasons why you'd store a derived attribute. And actually, I cover that way later in the term, but that's for performance reasons. Uh, but for 90% of the usage out there, stuff like how old is a person, you calculate it. You don't store it because you'd have to update it every freaking second. Uh, how much was that line order, that line item? That's probably, you know, three times 30. You know, you can calculate that as you go unless you're Amazon. Because you have so much data that you're going to kill the servers if you try to do that with every transaction. And the last one is the identifier attributes. Identifier attributes are used to identify. Okay, for example, in here, all the students have an identifier as far as the school is concerned. Your student number. I have an employee number, right? So my identifier is different than yours. But I still have a number. I'm still a number to the school, just like you guys are. To the Canadian government, if you're a Canadian citizen, you probably have a SIN number. That's your magic number as far as the Canadian government's concerned. Or whatever you have where you come from. Right? So that's how it, it's done in different places. Um, as far as the school concerned, you have a few other pieces, right? If you're a Canadian citizen, they probably have your SIN number. If you're a foreign exchange student, they probably have your identifier number from wherever you came from, plus your passport number or your student visa number. That's how they know who you are. They can uniquely identify you. Um, I've had classes where I actually had three students with the exact same name, first and last. It was really strange. And uh, yeah, and two even looked alike. It made it hard. Uh, but those are identifier attributes. They're pieces that are used to uniquely identify a piece of information. Um, not, not doesn't always mean you want to use that as your unique identifier in the database, that just happens to be the unique identifier you can use. Okay, oh, it's formatting on that slide's busted. It looks blurry. Oh, I know. Okay, ER model constructs. So when you're doing database design, you use something called an ER model, entity relationship model. And Different database software do them a little bit differently. Next week, I spend a fair amount of time explaining actually how to do the diagramming. Um, but the first lecture is all about terminology. And there are the three things we just finished talking about. Entities, relationships, and attributes. Now, entities, an entity instance, okay? We're gonna go with the student entity, right? So an entity type of student. An instance of that is each and every one of you. Right? You have a set of data, you've got a set of data, you've got a set of data, and somebody over there has got a set of data. And your set is different from his or hers or whomever else's I picked out. That you are in an instance. So you are a, an instance of a thing. God, I hate using that phrase, but that literally, you're a thing. You're a thing, but you're a different thing than this thing. Thing one, thing two, and thing three. In this room, there's a hundred and something things. Um, now, basically, it could be a person, place, object, event, or a concept. It often corresponds to a row in a table. This is the first time you've seen that word. And we talk, talk about it more in detail significantly later. But essentially, if you have an instance, it's equal to those of you that have worked in a database and you've retrieved records. It's one record in the database. So that's an entity instance. An entity type is a collection of entities, which usually corresponds to the table. Entity type, students. And if you just want to think about this, you guys are a small component, right? So look at it this way. Student, classroom, building, school, city, province, country, well, that's part of as high up as it goes. Other country. Um, or want to be a country if you're in Quebec. <laughs> what? I kind of make fun of the Quebecers once, at least once in my whole term. Uh, actually, I don't mind. I got lots of family in Quebec. It's just, you know, that's why I can make fun of them. Um, but that's a collection of entities. So in this room is a collection of students. 
So you can think of this room as being a table that contains students with a rogue record called the teacher. But essentially, this is a table that contains students. So this room is an entity type that contains a bunch of instances of you guys, if you want to think about it that way. Um, relationships. Okay, relationship instance. It's a link between entities. All right. You guys have a link to CST8215, right? You're a student in that. I have a link to CST8215 because I'm teaching the darn thing. Which means, via the course, we have a link. You are linked to the course. I'm linked to the course. I'm connected to you guys via one degree of separation. Um, usually, in this case, it would be the course code. Let's use the course code as a primary key for the courses. And then there's a course you're taking. You'd have that listed right now as a multi-valued attribute, you know, CST8215. I also have one called CST8215 on my side of the deal, which is part of the courses I teach, or the course I teach at this point in time. So those are the primary key, as in, you know, you've got the unique identifier, and the foreign key contains the reference to the other table. Um, when I start diagramming, this foreign key stuff makes a lot more sense. Okay. Relationship type. It's the category of relationship slash link between the entity types. For example, this would be, is it a one-to-one? -one? Is it a one-to-many? Right now I only teach one course, so technically it's a one-to-one, -one, but I could teach many courses. You guys can take many courses. Therefore, that's a many-to-many -many relationship, technically. Uh, that's the type. So you have, sometimes you have relationships that are one-to-many. For example, a child can only have one mother, one, one biological mother. A biological mother can have many kids, theoretically. I don't use daddies in this example because we know about that. Right? It's the, the connection's not the same. I used to use that example, and you know I realized that was a really stupid example. Uh, but a kid can have one biological mother, unless you're a pod person, or the mother can have many kids. What is the relationship type? Child to parent is one to one, but from parent is one to many. Okay, that's the relationship types. Attributes, those are, as I just finished describing in the previous slide, they're the characteristics that make up an entity. And normally in here, even though you all think you're unique and special, you all have the same basic attributes, they just describe differently. Right? Whether it's your skin color, your hair color, how much ink you've got on your body. You know, there's all kinds of things that describe you, but technically we can use the same descriptor for everyone else and we just put in a different value in it. And those, when you talk about the structure of a database, it corresponds to the fields in the table. So the attributes of an entity are equal to the fields in a table. Okay, now I'm going to talk about entities a bit more. Actually, this is almost a review slide. Um, once again, an entity can be a person, place, an object, or an event, or a concept uh, about which an organization wants to maintain data. So that's the expansion upon what is an entity. It's what do you want to maintain? What data do you want to keep? Um, an entity type. That's, you know, the combination of things that connect each other, essentially. Um, an entity type, the same thing as an instance, essentially. Um, but not. It's, they're, they're, like, so interrelated. It's terrible. Um, so a collection of entities that share common properties or characteristics. Bang. So an entity type and an entity are almost the exact same thing, right, if you think about it. So we define an entity as a student. Then we have an entity type called a student, even though technically the terminology doesn't mean the same thing, they're the same thing. Um, and then the instance is each and every one of you inside of it. So that's an entity. Yeah? <clears throat> okay. An entity is a thing. 
All right, so we've we established that, right? You're a thing, you're a thing, you know, we're all things. The entity type is a collection of things that have things in common. <laughs> God, I hate the word thing, but it's the only way to use to describe this. Okay, so an entity is a description of a, of a, of a person or an object. So for example, this classroom is an entity. Now the people in it, this classroom is an entity. Guess there's a classroom next door, right? It's also an entity, but they're, they're an entity type. In other words, they have characteristics that they share in common. Therefore, we can define multiple classrooms using the same definition. That's a type of entity. Whereas the entity is actually the actual definition. So you've got a, um, so the types, if we go by that again, we can go up one level past this, okay? You guys are students, but you're people. I'm a teacher, but I'm a person. There are entity type is person. The entity itself would be the piece, things that describe each person. Does that make a bit more sense? It makes more sense when we do more design later down the road. Um, just putting it out there, entity type here is not a phrase you hear very much. Um, entity, you hear lots. Entity instance, you hear a fair amount, depending where you work. This entity type is a phrase you almost never hear, but you know the terminology needs to be at least introduced in case you ever trip across it. So essentially, an entity describes something a collection of entities, so you've got teachers, you've got students, but they're both people. Those are entity types. And then the entity instance is, well, each of you are an instance, I'm an instance. Does that make, does that make a little more sense? Yeah, no, you'd have, okay, a class is an entity type. Um, for example, a class is an entity type. An office is um, actually a uh, class is an entity. An office an entity. But it just so happens that the entity type for them could be room, right? So an office is a room. A classroom is a room. The bathroom is a room. They share certain things in common. Yes. Uh, yes. No, the, the type is the generic side. The entity does the fine-tuned def definition. Because um, it just so happens that the type could be people, but there's a few attributes that makes the difference between a student and a teacher. And you may choose to store them in the same place. You choose to might not store them in the same place, depending on how you decide to find your data. So, yeah. <laughs> They're like side by side. Um, you could have times where the entity type is an entity, or you could have times where there's three kinds of entity in a given type. It just it's terminology that, depending on which side you, what kind of data you're dealing with, and which side you approach it, you either will approach it from the entity type side, or you'll approach it from the entity side, and then eventually you'll trip over the other one somewhere along the way. Uh, they're they're basically two sides of the same coin. Um, but like I said, entity type is not something you hear very often. It's not something you see as much as you used to. Um, usually most people actually get confused between entity type and instance more. Um, for example, an entity could be a person, but the entity type is a concept that defines a person. So for example, you're an instance of an entity, but your type is person. So basic entity type lives somewhere between entity and instance. That's it. It's just terminology. Um, and entity type, I don't expect for you to see on the exam, because it's just a, a muddly concept. OK. An entity should be an object that has many instances in the database. So, in other words, if I'm creating a database of students, therefore I'm going to create an entity to contain the students. 
right vicinity is a table. The students are rows. An entity, an object should always contain many instances. If you create an entity and it's everyone going to hold one value, you're doing something wrong. If you have a table in a database and it only ever has one value and it never changes, that is the wrong place to store that information. It's an object that's composed of multiple attributes. People are not one dimensional. There's more to you than just your SIN number or your student number. There are other things that describe you. Therefore, an entity should have multiple attributes, usually more than two. Um, it should be an object that we're trying to model. Now, in other words, we're computers, right? So we're going to create an entity called computer, and how would be some of the attributes that would describe it? You know, is it a desktop or a notebook? Is it an Intel processor or set on your cell, your computer on fire processor? Uh, that's known as AMD. Um, you know, does it have an NVIDIA card and an AMD card? You know, stuff like that. There's different things that describe it. Those are objects we try to describe. It, what it should not be, a user of the database itself. Now, that's a, that's a tricky statement because almost every database system has users defined inside of it. But that user that's defined inside of it should not be the person that's sitting at the keyboard per se. Um, it's a really hard exp explanation, but essentially um, an entity should not be a physical person that's physically touching a computer. You can store a definition of that person, but it should not be that person. You should not have an entity for every single person that uses the computer. So imagine if you're a company the size of Ikea and you created a new entity for every single employee. You created a new database table for every single one. They got thousands and thousands of users, of, of employees. That means there'd be thousands of entities. You know, entity number one, John Doe. Entity number two, Jane Doe. Entity number three, John Doe number two, because there's more than one. How many Thors do you think work for Ikea? Yeah, no, which, yeah, you, each employee would be an instance, not an entity. That's exactly it. So in other words, you'd have an employee's entity, and there would be an instance of each of those employees stored inside of it. So there'd be a row for every employee inside the employee's table. Just like there's a row for every student inside the student's table. And I'm really simplifying the student management system, by the way, by saying that. Um, and it should not be an output of the database system. And by that, I mean it should not be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A report. How many of you have gotten your tax returns back? Okay. How many of you have filed your tax returns yet? Most of us, I hope. Um, now, the letter of assessment you return is an output. You don't store the actual letter of assessment. You store the data that makes up the letter of assessment. And then you pass it through a little piece of magic and out comes a piece of paper that looks like, you know, you owe us lots of money or we owe you money. Or if you did it right, nobody owes anybody anything. Yes, but the, the, the difference is you create an entity that describes people, and each person is an instance of that. What you don't create is a new entity for every single person. So let's say I decide to create a database of my own to track my students. Instead of using Blackboard or using whatever else we can use, I decide I'm going to do this, and I do it wrong. So instead of creating an instance of so I create a table called students and I put you know you in it and I put you in it as a one instance of data in other words one row for each student I create a new table for each and every one of you so 
Imagine instead of being everybody in this room, I'm going to teach this course. But before I can teach this course, I give each and every you your own private classroom. And so magically, I can talk to you all at the same time. Now, can you imagine technology? Well, actually, right now I'm doing it because I'm recording. But, you know, say 20 years ago, can you imagine how hard that would have been to do? Right, where you'd have, I'd have, there'd be some sort of voodoo magic so that you could actually act actively participate in the class if each of you were your own little room by yourself. That's the difference. That's, that's an entity is the room. So if that entity only holds one person, it's badly designed. Whereas we have a classroom here where I can get a bunch of you in at the same time. Does that make it a little clear? Sure. That's entirely possible. Uh, but usually not a person. Um, but there are the odd case where you could actually have an entity becoming an instance of something else. Um, but realistically, in practical cases, where it actually the way it actually works is, um, if it has attributes, and you can have more than one. In other words, you got your partner sitting next to you right now, and you both have similar attributes, right? You have a name. You have a unique identifying number, student number. Therefore, I can describe you using your characteristics. And you share the same characteristics, like the same descriptors, not necessarily the same values in it, but same descriptors. That means you are an instance, not an entity. You're this, the this thing that describes who you are. And I'm going to use this roughly. Your, the DNA that identifies you is your instance. The structure of the DNA Theoretically, it could be the same, but the value inside the DNA, the order of the stuff in it's different, right? So that means that you're an instance. If you, what you're trying to describe has um, attributes, as in, if you're almost exactly the same, as far as dis things we can use to describe you, not the actual descriptions, things we can use to describe you as someone else, you should be creating an entity to contain the different versions of those descriptions. Does that make it a little clearer? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, okay, so for example, let's just say we did it the way you described it, right? We have a table called John. And inside of John, we've got a date of birth, and an address, okay? Now we got another table called Jane, which also has a date of birth and an address. So now we have two tables we need to maintain. On the other hand, if we had one called persons, and in here we have a name, a date of birth, and an address. Now, at first, this looks exactly the same, right? Almost the same. But where it changes is if we put in, if we look at how the data is actually stored. If we go with the person's table, we have a name, a date of birth, and an address. We have John, we have Jane, one one oh six seven six ninety two one two three some street four five six other street okay now if I did this instead our data would look something like this John One dash one oh six and one two three bang. And at this point, John's ever only ever going to contain that one value. Suddenly we have another one called Jane. One actually we call this uh, 
seven six ninety two and four five six. Now this one's floating by itself. It's everyone only going to have one value. Let's say I need to retrieve people that are a certain age. Now we've got a thousand tables like this. We'd have to do a thousand requests to the server to find each and every one of those. And you have to know what they're called. In this case, I can say, give me everybody. And it just gives it to you as a list. That's the difference between This is an instance. This is the entity. <coughs> Does that make it a little clear? Once you actually see quote, quote, real data attached to it. Okay. Oh, I spent a lot more time on that slide than I expected it to. Yeah, we've got another question. You sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll go with that. Um, I say I'm not a Java developer, so, you know, people use that terminology. I'm like, oh. Uh, but I do know about object orientation. So if you want to think about it, an entity is an object. The attributes are the properties. But considering, you know, most of you guys are probably level one, and have you had your first programming class yet? No? Okay. So, you know, that's why I tend, I used to use that example when I was teaching this as part of a level two. As a level one, it gets a little, you know, harder to explain concept that you guys have never seen before. <laughs> so, okay. Right. Okay, required versus optional attributes. All right, so we got our attributes here, right, that we described. Um, now, required, it must have a value for every entity instance uh, or relationship. As you notice, it's in brackets because some people use the phrase interchangeably. And I hate that there's, you know, you can use the same phrase that means the same thing, but it sounds completely different. Um, so required attribute is something that is absolutely required. An optional means even though it's defined, you may not always have it. Now I'm going to ask a really strange question. This used to be a great question when I first started teaching like 12 years ago. How many of you do not have a cell phone? Hot damn, there's still one Luddite left. I'm not making fun of you. Yeah, I just picked on you. But that's funny because usually I have more than one. This is probably the last time I ever asked that question. <laughs> that's a rarity. <laughs> but cell phone number might be, an, your telephone number might be a required attribute, but your cell phone number may not be. I guess I got to turn it around and say, how many of you actually have a landline? Yeah, there we go. The rest of you are all living off cell phones, right? So that's almost as bad the other way. Um, but for example, those would be Optional. That's why actually you'll see a lot of websites now that don't have phone number and cell anymore. They just give you phone. You put in whatever the heck you want in it. Uh, they don't want to discriminate against one group or the other. Somebody could be offended. I don't have a landline, so why should I have to give you that number? Okay, so if we look at this diagram up here, uh, maybe the mouse will work. Maybe the mouse won't work today. Okay, student ID is required. So at the college here, that'd be the equivalent of your student number. Why is it required? Well, the college needs to know who you are uniquely. And if you share the same name as someone else and the same date of birth as someone else, and it just so happens that you're not from the same country, therefore you don't have unique SIN numbers. But actually, I've seen that happen where the people had two, the same SIN number, but one came from England, one came from Canada. When I did that example in class, I said, oh, I got the same, I got, the, you know, my SIN number's the same as such, such, and it screws up every time they try to find me. Um, so you have a student ID. It's unique. It identifies you. Student name is required. You should not be able to attend a school unless we know who you are, your name. Now, it's a required attribute. It doesn't mean it's a unique attribute. It's just a required attribute. 
the student ID, by the way, would probably be unique. Um, home address. Normally, your address when you register to school is required. Why would it be required? We need to know where you're at. Normally, unless you're living in your car. But, you know, we need to usually know where you're at. Hey? Yeah, where'd you park? Well, that, see, the home address is kind of weird, right? When you talk about students, is it? Do they mean your address while you're here in Ottawa, or do they mean your address where you came from? What is your home address? <clears throat> for a lot of you, your home address is probably Ottawa, but for some of you, your home address might be you know, Beijing, or it could be Tokyo, or it could be London, England, right? So depending on how they decide to track the data, the, home ad the meaning of home address changes. But it usually means, what is your home locale? Um, that is required. Same thing with the city, the state, and the zip code. Um, those are required so that we can actually mail you your information, your bills, and your maybe your diploma if you paid for it. Now they make the on this one here. They're using the per, the your major <coughs> as optional. Uh, why? Because sometimes students will actually register with a school and not pick a program right away. Um, usually, you guys are part of a program. You signed up for a program, so you're part of the program right off the bat. But did you know the people that use the um, C call, the School of Continuing Online Learning? You can actually take courses and not declare what course you're in, what program you're in. Until you've collected enough courses, that you say, you know, I think I'm going to declare for this. And then you can declare your mate, your your diploma you're targeting. Uh, it's kind of weird. You can pick and choose courses as you go, and then eventually you'll realize, I got, holy crap, I got six of the five, uh, six of the seven courses that I need to be able to get this certificate. Well, maybe I'll finally declare my major. And that's why it's optional in this case. Um, you can register with a school, but not actually have, you know, a program, theoretically. Everything. Yeah. Um, that's actually later on in the design process where you start creating uh, specific kind of keys to uniquely identify rows. Uh, that's part of the design process when you start identifying primary keys and that kind of stuff, which is next week's lecture. Um, but that's part of it. Um, in this case, the student ID will be your unique row in this table. Well, well, you create the record and it synthetically generates one. It's a synthetic number. It's known as a synthetic key. I, that's covered, like I said, it's covered in a later lecture, but essentially you create a key that's synthetic. <coughs> it creates a number out of the ether and assigns it to you. Same thing when you get, you, see, you apply for your SIN card here in Canada. The government gives you a number. Congratulations. <coughs> Where'd this number come from? A little algorithm. That's all there is to it. Okay. A composite attribute. I talked about that earlier, but this actually has an example on the screen. It has an address. A composite attribute is made up of multiple pieces. It can be broken down into component can pieces. Essentially, if it's a, that's what a composite is. If your data can be broken down into smaller pieces, it's composite. Your date of birth, oh, people always argue with me about this, a date of birth technically is not, you can't break down a date of birth. Yeah, you can break down a year, month, day, but it's really not. You know, really the date of birth is a date of birth. Your address is made up of multiple pieces. Okay, and once again, the multi-valued versus the derived. Um, I explained that one fairly well earlier. Uh, this one shows an example of a multi-valued and a derived. Multi-valued would be the skills an employee has. 
For example, where I work, we have C++ developers. We have a, some, a couple of C-sharp guys. One of those C-sharp guys is also a C++ developer. Uh, we have two PHP developers. One is a PHP specialist and doesn't know a whole lot other than PHP. The other guy is a C-sharp guy and also with PHP. So he's got skills that apply to both sides of the business. He also happens to have some basic database design skills. I have more than basic, but you know we both have database design skills. We have people that can draw. We have people that can't draw. Those are skills. And most people have more than one skill. If you only have one skill, you should really work on getting more than one. But most people have more than one skill. That's a multi-valued attribute. In other words, what are your skills? A derived attribute, as I said earlier, years employed. So my start date is March 12th, 2000. Based on, I mean, May 12th, 2000. Based on that, how do I know what my start date is? Versus how many years have I been employed? 17 years, almost to the day. Which is how long I've been at Cadillac. Just so, you know, there's the magic number. I don't need to store that because I can calculate it. That's a derived attribute. So this slide shows examples of both. All right. Identifiers, also known as keys. There's two kinds. Um, but this slide doesn't talk about the two kinds. This talks about the stupid terminology behind it. An identifier is an attribute or a combination of attributes that uniquely identify an individual instance. All right, lots of verbiage. What does that mean? You guys are all instances of students. How do you, how do you identify yourself to the school? Your student number. That is your unique identifier. That is your primary key. That's it. Um, sometimes you'll have databases where you have, um, you use what they call a real piece of data as your key. Um, those are usually known as candidate identifiers. Uh, for example, it's an attribute that could be an identifier until it falls over. For example, if you are a Canadian grade school, actually you can't even use that because they're doing all the tracks and numbers. Um, now we'll still go with, now we're, okay, we're going to do an employment data, an employee database. So a candidate identifier could be your social, social security number or your social identity, you know, your SID number, your SSN or whatever. It is in other countries. Um, those are candidate keys, as in they could be used to uniquely identify you. Now, by that having been said, that doesn't always work well. So you end up, well, as part of the design process, you want to identify all the candidate keys. So you'd use your SIN number as a possible candidate key. Now, if you're a foreign exchange student and you don't have a SIN number, what could they use to identify you? Your passport number or your, your visa number, depending on what country you have. You might have a different piece of paper because you, some countries you have to apply to, be a, to get a student visa and that has a different number than your passport number, depending on where you come from. Now, if you're a Canadian citizen, so back to being Canadian again, you have a SIN number. Is it guaranteed that you have a passport number? No, because it's entirely possible you've reached a certain stage in your life and you've never had a passport. It's getting harder to go shopping in the States if you don't have one. But, you know, if you don't, you, the passport's not a guarantee. The SIN number is also not a guarantee, but those are candidate keys, as in they can theoretically be identifiers depending on what the data is going to do. That's why they're considered candidates. Um, now, the other one is a simple versus composite. A simple key means it's one piece of data that uniquely identifies you. A composite key is you require two or more pieces of data to identify you. For example, 
you have a SID number and a passport number. They're not the same thing. It's killing me. I'm trying not to laugh. It didn't work. And now she's mortified. <laughs> Don't feel bad. That's happened. I've, I've actually had my phone go off in class, uh, which is why you probably noticed me trying to make sure it was muted earlier. Um, but the problem is when you have a composite key, <laughs> could be, oh, we're going to identify the students using composite key. We're going to use the, their, their SIN number slash SSN number slash something plus their passport number. That's a composite key. But that won't work because not necessarily everything. No, you can't, oh, unless you can 100% always guarantee that the person will provide you with that information and it will always be unique. Now that's a composite key. You're talking about an actual one of these? Ah. Uh, tons of different ways. Um, essentially what they do is they scan your fingerprint and then they put a grid on top of it and they, they, they mark off the intersex, intersection points and it gets put in as a bunch of coordinates. Um, is it possible to have identical? No. In the real world? Physically? Physically it's impossible to have two identical fingerprints. Data-wise, is there a possibility of a collision? Possibly, and depending on how fine-grained they do the scan. Uh, so, you know, physical attributes of a person. You know, a retinal scan, it's great. Uh, fingerprints are great, but, you know, theoretically. You know, there are identical twins out there that have the same fingerprints. And you've got people that don't have the same fingerprint in both hands. So, you know, they do the good stuff with the right hand and do the bad stuff with their left hand. Unless they're on Reddit, then they have to choose, you know, somebody else's hand. Um, but that's, you know, a simple versus composite attribute means that you're using multiple fields to uniquely identify something. It's usually a bad idea. You want to use simple attributes as your identifiers. Why? Because it, you're only depending on one thing. You're not depending on a variety of things to identify something. Okay. Criterias for identifiers. Okay, first you want to choose identifiers that will not change in value and will not be null. Um, you guys haven't had a programming class yet, so how many of you know the concept of null? Uh, null means absence of value. Right? You have a box that's vacuum sealed. There's nothing inside that box. There's no air. There is nothing. But the space for that box has been defined. Thus, the inside of that box is null. Yes? Uh, theoretically, yes, depending what programming language you're using. In databases, you're either null or not null. Uh, in JavaScript, you have uh, none. Null, value, and whoops. Uh, whoops usually means you put something in there that didn't belong. Uh, and then your browser shits the bed. Now, usually an identifier doesn't change in value. People say, oh, well, my SIN number doesn't change in value. Anybody here ever had their identi identity stolen? and you had to get a new SIN number because of it? Your SIN number can change. It's rare, but it can happen. Can your SIN number be null? If you're a foreign exchange student, of course it can be, because you don't have a Canadian SIN number, thus it's null. Therefore, does that make a SIN number a good way to identify a person? No. All right, you want to avoid intelligent identifiers. Now, intelligent identifiers is actually a misnomer because uh, if you use them, you're an idiot. It means that you define an identifier based on a location. Imagine if your student number was prefixed with OTT dash your student number. 
That means you could never go to the Pembroke co uh, campus. They'd have to give you a new identifier, even though you're a student at Algonquin. And there once was a time when they had the masonry course out in, in Crumpton Place or Smith Falls, wherever that other campus was. And the students would actually go there two days a week and come to Ottawa two days a week. That means that their student number wouldn't work between the two locations because it had an intelligent identifier that was based on their primary location. Because your location can change. How many of you have changed cities at least once in your life? Now, I'm sure some of you aren't telling the truth. We'll go with it. Um, because if you're from somewhere else and you're in Ottawa to go to school, you've changed cities, technically. So you can't use that as an identifier because it can change. So substitute. For example, if you decide that your key is going to be SID number plus passport number, that's complicated because you can't guarantee that it's always going to work. Therefore, you want to substitute that with something simpler. Um, and by simpler, I mean you're going to substitute it for, you're going to create a, basically a synthetic key. All right, I got to step up this a bit. Okay, when you're defining the attributes, man, it's going to be hard to read. It's a good thing the slide shows up on Blackboard. Um, when you define an attribute, you want to state what the attribute is and why it's important. Right? person's name is an attribute. Why is it important? Because it's your name. Make it clear what it is and is not included in the attribute's value. In other words, if your attribute value is first name and its purpose in life is contain your first name, does it make sense to put in the last name in there? No. If you have to do aliases, in other words, for some unknown reason, you've got to use some stupid naming conventions for a field, whatever happens to be, document why you're giving it a stupid name. If there's some restriction why you can't use date of birth as the field, then you end up storing it as DOB. Not everybody's going to know what DOB stands for, therefore document what DOB stands for and what goes into it. State the sources of values. In other words, where can the data come from? So you're doing the initial design and you're trying to make sure that everybody understands that you know, a person's name comes from the person. Um, you should state whether or not the attribute value can change once it's set. Data goes in, can it be changed, yes or no? The point of a database is so you can change the data. But every once in a while there's some things you can't change, such as a primary key should not change. Imagine if you could suddenly change your SIN number and say, today I don't want to be this, I'm going to be this. <laughs> Done. It's not good. Uh, you should specify whether it's required or optional. Sometimes you should also allow a state what the min and max number of occurrences are allowed. That's rare. That's an edge case. What they call an edge case is, in other words, saying in this field, this attribute, there can only be six different possible values. Indicate whether or not there's relationships on other attributes. For example, this, the name is dependent on the SIN number. It shouldn't be, but, you know, it could be. All right. Types of relations. Um, like I said, this lecture is brutal because it's all terminology. Next week I do pretty pictures. Okay, there's something called referential integrity relations and logical relations. Those are two different things. Referential integrity relations are hard set rules. There's one to many. One teacher one database teacher, many database students. One to many. One to one. Every table in a relation must have a matching record. These are rare. You don't tend to want to use them. And nowadays, most database servers, you don't have to do that unless there's a really specific reason for it. Um, one of the uses for that is if you need to restrict access to some data. For example, in your student records, a vast part of the college staff can see your name, your email address, maybe the list of courses you're taking, and that's it. But some of the other higher-ups can see your SIN number, 
your last what credit card they used to pay for your or whatever you used to pay for your your tuition that kind of stuff they could have that in a separate table that is controlled with tighter security it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two but they've been separated for security reasons and that's why you do a one-to-one -one. Uh, it used to be database servers also had a limited number of columns you could put in the table those of us past this, uh, that have reached a certain level of aging will remember a database product called dbase we're going way back but dbase had a limit of 75 columns to a table guess what happens if you needed to put in 76 you created a new table with a one-to-one -one relationship between the two and then the data crawled down and down uh, many to many it's a table that cross references each other uh, people are just not using this anymore why because it's bad um, essentially what happens is you have two tables or two entities that are related to each other and you end up with this little cross magical cross reference thing it starts looking like a genealogy tree from Kentucky where everybody's related to everybody else <laughs> okay but there I've once dealt with that kind of a structure and I'm glad I had a backup that day because I was told to please clean out the database and I deleted a record and that I much to my chagrin and lack of knowledge at that point in time of the database structure because I just started there but I'm pretty sure they actually did this as a joke to, to punish me by the time it was done deleting there was 10,000 rows in the table by the time it was deleting there were six because it cascaded up and started deleting all the parent like basically I deleted one and it was a parent of another record which was a parent of another record which was a parent of another record and eventually it's the whole I just I killed my ancient ancient grandparents magically by looking the wrong way and poof the whole family tree got deleted people don't do that anymore so they used called there's two things now two phrases but they mean the same thing there is a phrase called has habitum has and belongs to many this is also known as a um, a bridge table or a um, oh, drawing a blank there's another word and I'm sure it's going to show up in a bit uh, but there is another word to describe to you that you use to connect the two uh, but essentially you have two tables and you create a third one to link between the two a a what table? Uh, no, no, it's not a word. I just remember what it is. And it's actually either going to be in this slideshow or the next week's slideshow. Um, but there is a table that you create that allows the connection between the two so that each row in there uniquely identifies one connection between the other two tables. Thus, if you need to delete one piece from here, you delete this one plus the matching records in this one, and that's it. And you don't end up with this never ending loop of death. Um, oh, it's driving me nuts because I know that terminology too. Drawing a blank. Hey? No, no, it's it's an actual word like entity, but it has a name. Like I said, I'll, I'll find it shortly and it's it's going to drive me nuts. I'll probably remember as everybody's leaving. Um, then there's something called logical relations. These aren't the physical connections between things. It's the connections um, between, you know, logically how things are connected. There's something called a singlet. It's a standalone table. It lives by itself in the little corner. It's the neat of the database world. He sits in the basement, doesn't do anything. He contains data, but doesn't interact with the outside world. You got parent-child. Now, parent-child is a, a table that has many children. Thus, a mother can have many kids, but a kid usually only has one mother. Um, it's also usually a reference table when it's just a, a pure parent child uh, there's something called master detail so those are two regular tables set up in a parent child arrangement for example an order and order line you can have many orders and each order can have many order lines each of those are full entities on their own but they have a relationship or one's contained inside the other but there's more than just two or three attributes that define them. Oh, we're running out of time. Okay, um, there's degrees of relationship. There's urinary, binary, and ternary. 
Um, unary are self-relating tables. Um, they're not very common. They're usually used in a tree-like structure. How many of you remember Yahoo back like when Yahoo was still good? Okay, it was a catalog, right? You clicked on the link and then there was more links. You click on that link, there's more links. And it basically built this giant tree of useful information. That is how you generate, that's what unary tables are used for. It's a table that's related to itself. It's its own parent. Binary relationships. And actually, I'm just going to pull up the next slide so because it has pictures. Binary, binary relationships. Those are entities of two different types that are related to each other. For example, I'm a teacher, you're a student. You know, there's a relationship, a simple relationship between the two of us. But there's also ternary relationships, which means there's three different types that are related to each other. And then there's, you know, past that four, five, six, but essentially they're all the same thing past that. Um, it just means, if you hear ternary, it means that there's three tables that are connected to each other. That's all it means. 90% uh, of the relationships you deal with are binary. As in other words, there's one table that's connected to another table. Yeah, it would be an org chart where you got all the employees and employee reports to employee B, employee B reports to CEO, CEO reports to his wife. You know, there's an organization chart. Or to her husband, got, can't be, you know. Um, there's cardinality, and I already covered some of that already. One-to-one, uh, -one. In, in other words, both relationships have the same, they're connected with each other, one-to-many, and many-to-many. -many. So this is actually a repeat of a previous slide with a different definition. Uh, I don't tend to repeat it too much, but I included it in the slideshow, so if you download it, you can see the, diff the different choice of words. Okay, there's constraints. Cardinality constraint means the number of instances one entity can have or not. Then, then there's a minimum cardinality. If the minimum cardinality is zero, that means it's an optional. In other words, you can have an order without order lines. Right? You just created a new order, but there's you haven't added anything to it yet. Therefore, this order exists, but there's no child rows. Therefore, the cardinality on its side is zero. But if you require it, then it's mandatory. In other words, um, if you're filling out an address and they make state or province required, that's a mandatory. And then there's the maximum cardinality, which is obviously the maximum number, which is one or many. All right, so <laughs> here we go. There's some symbols for these things, and when I do the diagramming next week, the symbols become more obvious. Um, cardinality, mandatory one, it's two lines. Optional one, optional one. Mandatory many, this first line is mandatory, many is the crow's foot. This is known as crow's foot notation. It looks like a little bird foot. Optional many, in other words, there could be many, but it's optional. Now, in this example, a patient has history. History has a patient, and they've made it mandatory that you can't have a patient without history. So there's always one patient, and it's mandatory. In other words, the patient must have history, and the history must have one patient. But the patient can have many pieces of history. That's the little gross book. And here's the phrase I couldn't remember earlier. It's on the next slide. Associative entities. Big, long slide. <clears throat> remember earlier I said you create a table to connect the other two? That's the word associative entity. It associates two other entities. So if we want to use that as an example, you guys are an, an entity. I'm an entity. The classroom is our associative entity. We're associated using this classroom. <laughs> um, all relationships to associative entities should be many. In other words, it's one to many. So one of the parent to many of the associative entity. Um, it's possible that it has meaning outside of the, uh, the parents. 
Um, that could be active, not active, you know, start date, that kind of stuff. If you have a ternary relationship, it should be a converted associative entity. Why? Because it gets too complicated to keep track of. The associative entities make sense. I'll, when I diagram next week, it'll actually, the pictures will make it make more sense. Um, and an associative entity can participate in multiple relationships other than the, the basic one. For example, student, program, right? CP is a program, student, you know, is an entity. And in the middle, you could have courses. So this program is made up of these courses. The students is taking these courses. They might not be taking all the courses at all the time. So that means there's four tables that connect you to the program. The program, the course, the courses the student is taking, and the student. The students, the, the courses you're taking makes you connected to the, to the program. I'm going to skip the next slide because it's not important right now. Um, basic parts of a table, and I'm going to, I'm not going to make it to the end today, which is fine. <clears throat> um, basic parts of a table, the primary key. Primary key is used to uniquely identify a single row of data. Earlier, I was talking about single keys. Simple keys, that's your primary key. In the school, your primary key is your student number. Outside of school, it's probably something else. Um, a description field of some sort. Most tables have another field other than the primary key. For example, name. Or it could be a description of something. So, you know, there's a field that describes what that row is. Um, often in modern database design, tables have timestamp fields. Uh, there's usually two. When was it created and when was it last modified? So right now, I just identified four fields or attributes of every entity, right? Their primary key, which is a unique identifier, a description that describes what that piece of data is, two timestamp fields. And usually to go with it is you'll have a user ID field of some sort, usually the created and or modified. Um, why are these fields now important? Uh, anybody here recognize the name Enron? Or now, thanks to that, Soros, uh, Sox, Soros Bain Oxley. Uh, and that, that those, basically those are laws that have been put in place because people cheated. And now the rules are when you have to do with any kind of financial systems, you have to track who touched one, who touched what, when. And basically how hard did they touch it. Um, so, you know, those are basically the, right now I'm up to automatically six fields for every table. Some of them aren't as important. Like if you're doing a reference table, do you need to know who created it or when was it last modified, you know, that kind of stuff? Not as important. Um, there's also one you might see called, called active or enabled. Is that record still valid? We might want to not see it anymore, but we can't delete it. Therefore, we want to mark it as, you know, inactive or disabled or whatever choose phrase you want to use. And the application takes care of filtering that stuff out. Okay. Here's a simple basic table with the first five fields you normally see plus the active, first four field plus active. Um, you got the primary key, which is ID, the name, created, modified, and when was it active? Uh, these are basic values, basic data types. I cover this in detail probably in two weeks, what this is. All right, uh, I'm gonna pull the plug on it here uh, because the naming conventions take more than two minutes. So I'll jump into that at the start of next week's lecture. They're not important today. Um, and that's it.